Well, good morning, Harvester. I want to start by just uh, saying thank you to the worship team. Just give them a hand. They do a great job. I tell you what, uh, these guys get up here before I get up here, and they've been going at it for a while by the time I get here, and, and thank you so much for leading us in worship, guys. Um, hey, uh, we're finishing a series called Discover Harvester, and all of this series is, is our attempt to tell you what we believe a follower of Jesus looks like. And, and I'm going to finish by just talking about how we can unleash the hope of Jesus to the world. And I'm going to start by just remembering these, uh, this saying, WWJD, this phrase. How many of you remember that? It stands for, what would Jesus, what? Do. What would Jesus do? And I tell you what, people made all kinds of things about it. There were car stickers, there were necklaces, bracelets. How many tattoos do we have in the audience with WWJD? No tattoos. Okay, good. Because here's the problem with WWJD, that we really don't know what a first century celibate Jewish rabbi would do, do we? You don't know what that's like. You don't know that, you know, you haven't lived that life. And, and actually, that is part of the problem in today's church, that we try to take sometimes people to Jesus, the Jesus of the first century, and they just get a little lost. They don't know exactly how to interpret that. He seems antiquated because we're trying to take him there instead of trying to get Jesus to come into our culture today. So here's what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that we change WWJD to WWJD IHWM. Really catchy. Really catchy. What would Jesus do if he were me? If he were a 21st century mom, what would Jesus do? How would he raise those children? How would he, you know, be a wife to, to her husband? What would Jesus do if he were a college student? How would he face the opposition that he will see or she will see in college? What would Jesus do if he were a manager at a factory and he has, you know, to manage a bunch of people that are like cats, and they all want to go their own direction. How do you do it in a godly way? What would Jesus do if you are just, you know, just a, a retired grandparent that loves her family or her family? And how can you be an influence and leave a legacy? What would Jesus do if you're a construction worker, and you get to be around a bunch of, you know, rough people, but you love them and you love the work, and how can you show Jesus, you know, in situations where it may be less than appropriate? I don't know. That's the answer that we need to, to, to get today, the, to say we don't need to take people to the first century. We need to bring the Jesus into the 21st century. And what does that look like? See, to unleash hope, we must not take the culture to Jesus, but bring Jesus to the culture. And we're going to start in Acts chapter 1, the book of Acts. I hope that you have been able to read this amazing book over the, this month. In fact, if you follow it along, you should be reading chapter 28 today and finishing it. And if you did so, that's awesome. I think, I hope that you've been blessed. Uh, but we're going to start with this book. In, in the first two verses, we're going to see what Luke says. Uh, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So Luke is, is saying that Jesus, in his first book, he wrote about all that Jesus began to do. Now, what was, you know, the first book of Luke was the Gospel of Luke. Luke. And so think about the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts as like a two-volume book set. So in the first volume, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke writes about all that Jesus began to do in his ministry. But then he begins his second volume by saying, Jesus isn't done. In fact, he just began to do those things in, in the gospel, the things that you see in his ministry, he, but he's going to continue doing them, and I'm going to show you how he's going to do it through the Holy Spirit now, through the apostles, through the church. And so what we get from, from the first two verses already is that Jesus continues to do his work through the church. Now, what was Jesus doing? What are the things that are going to continue happening through the church. Well, let's go to the book of Luke chapter 4 to find out a little more. Verses 40 through 43. And 
Luke in this passage just gives a summary of what was happening at the time of the ministry of Jesus. And he says that at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. So when we ask the question, what are the things that will continue happening in the book of Acts? And if you read the book, you'll know exactly what what I'm talking about. Basically the same things that we read here. There is the preaching of the gospel. There are, there's healing through the Holy Spirit. There is, you know, things that are happening that God is doing. And, and here's the thing. The question is, this is where I start to lose some of you, okay? You're like, but, but can that happen through us, through me? Listen to John for in, the, in the epistle of John, 1 John, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, to see what the apostle John says about this. He says that if anyone obeys his word... Love for God is truly made complete in them. So we need to obey God's word. We need to obey what Jesus is telling us. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. We need to live as Jesus did. In other words, we need to do the things that he did. And like I said, this is the point where most of us, when we have heard a teaching similar to this one, you disconnect. This is the point where you're like, well, Jesus is God, but I'm, I'm just me. Like, you don't know me. It's like, I'm a mess. I can't even, you know, just get to work on time. How am I supposed to do the things that Jesus did? Like, I get it. I am know me. You don't know me. I'm a mess as well. But I'm telling you that what do we do with the words of John and Luke here that tell us, you know, that we are going to do some of the things that Jesus was doing. Now, All this comes down to one question. When you think about Jesus, do you think of him as someone who came to earth to flex his God muscles and show us what we couldn't do? Or do you see him as a prototype, the first fruits? The Bible says that Jesus was the first fruit. That means that he was a a type of or a prototype of, of a human. So Jesus is really what humanity with God is supposed to look like. Where did Jesus get, just where, how was he empowered to do the things that he did? How was he able to preach with such power, to do, just to minister to people in such a way? Well, I think the answer is in the book of Luke as well. Luke 4, 14 says this. Right after Jesus was baptized, the Bible, and, and then he was tempted, the Bible says that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of what? Of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. So one of the things that you need to understand, the book of Philippians chapter 2 tells us this, that Jesus, even though he was in the form of God, he didn't cling to that form as something to be desired, but he left that form to be, take the form of a servant. So Jesus was 100% God, but when he was on earth, he let go of those things, and he relied on the Holy Spirit just like you and I. Just like you and I. Why do you think that Jesus went to solitary places and prayed so much because he was relying on the Holy Spirit. So this is a misconception. You think that Jesus just did it all on his own. Could he have? Yes, he's God. But I believe the Bible teaches that he relied on the Holy Spirit. Listen to uh, verses 18 and 19 of uh, Luke 4. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me, he has selected me, anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What I'm trying to say, church, is this. We need to stop seeing Jesus as a unique character that we could never follow or do the things that he did. And we need to start seeing him as a prototype. This is what Michael Ramsey, a a writer and theologian, says. He says, in Jesus' incarnation, we see what a real human being is like. 
we see what God had in mind from the very beginning. What human beings have the potential to, to become if reunited with God. So that perfect unity, when we, when we start living with God, living life with God, what, that's what we talked about last week, you start acting different. You can actually do things that, you know, before you couldn't do. You can let go of certain affections. You can change your life. Your life is transformed. And then you start doing some of the things that Jesus did, and, and that's what we're going to talk about today. How can we unleash the hope? How can we do the things that Jesus did in the 21st century so that we can bring him to people today? Many times Jesus has lost relevance because we want to take people to a culture that's foreign to them, a time that is foreign to them. But if they could just see what Jesus is like today, maybe they'll be attracted to him. So here's what we need to do. The first thing that we need to do to unleash hope in the 21st century is this. Simply offer hospitality. John Mark Comer comes, with some of, comes up with some of these ideas. Um, and I, I took some of these ideas from his book, Practicing the Way, but, uh, and I just adapted them to us. But here's the one thing that I, I, I think we need to understand. People today, unfortunately, culture today, see, Christ, see Christianity as the problem, not the solution. God portrays his son Jesus in the church as the solution, as the light of the world, Unfortunately, somehow along the way, it got lost. And right now, you can ask people, and the church is actually part of the problem. I mean, you can go and ask you know, anyone in, in our society who is not a believer, and they'll say, well, it's because of the church that we have a male-dominated culture and where women get put down, and we have racism, and you know, we have you know, corruption and problems in government. I mean, we get blamed for a lot of it, and you know, it's not... Whether it's right or wrong, the church has probably made mistakes along the way. But what we need to understand is that we need to create a space for God in a culture that is hostile to the church. And that's a tall order. How do you, you know, talk to people who believe you are the problem? And how do you tell them, wait, I may be part of the problem, but Jesus isn't. And, and believe me, we're not trying, if, if we make mistakes, it's not on purpose. Like, how do you overcome that barrier? Well, the first step, I think, is to simply offer hospitality. Become people that are, use hospitality just as a way to break down those barriers. You know, someone said, they need to know that we care for them. Someone said, you know, before I care about what you have to say, I need to know that you care. I need to know that you care about me. And so, how can we break those barriers? Same way Jesus did, by eating and drinking. You know, by eating and drinking with people. And I'm not referring only to just uh, alcohol drinks, okay, alcoholic drinks. You can drink Mountain Dew with people. You can drink Dr. Pepper with people. But Jesus ate and, and had meals with people. Listen to Luke 19, verses 5 through 10. Luke 19. He said that he entered Jericho, and verse 5 says, When Jesus reached his spot, he looked and said to him, Zacchaeus, Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And then we know from another passage that Zacchaeus threw a party, a big banquet. And so Jesus was having a meal, was eating and drinking with them, right? And then verse 7 says, All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be to a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus goes to the house of you know, people that maybe most of society didn't like. Most of us, if you realize this, tend to eat with people that we like. It's like you don't go out and have a meal with someone you don't like. You tend to eat with people that you like, people that look like you, people that believe the same things that you believe. Jesus didn't. He did it a different way. In fact, someone said Jesus got himself crucified by the way he ate. He got himself crucified because he ate with all the wrong people. He ate with traitors like Zacchaeus, right? A Jewish person that betrayed the Jewish people to go work for the Romans. He ate with prostitutes, 
with Gentiles, with adulterers, with the unclean. Jesus' meals were not meant to keep people out. He was actually using meals as a way to bring people in, to invite people in to his kingdom. And that is powerful because we all crave connection. But right now, when we think we are against one another, you can't share the message of the gospel in that, those circumstances. We need to become people of hospitality. That makes a difference. Uh, there is the story of a British soldier during World War II when Italy went to North Africa trying to conquer Libya in that section. Some of the British soldiers were captured and taken back to Italy. And as they were entering Rome, uh, the Italian people went out to the streets and they were cussing them out. They were spitting on them. They were punching those who they could. And this, this British soldier recalls like walking down and being afraid for his life, not knowing what's going to happen. And he said in the midst of the crowd, he sees this little girl carry a peach and handing it to him. He's like, she just handed me this peach and I just cut, you know, cu cupped it with both hands and I started eating it. He said it was the sweetest peach I've ever tasted. He said during the following months and, and years, actually it was a couple of years, that he was a, a prisoner of war until he was liberated. He said, you know, at times I was losing hope, but I was always reminded of this little girl who came out of a crowd that was spitting and yelling and cussing and punching us and handed me this little peach. He said, and I always remember that there is always a little girl with a peach out there. And that gave him hope. They have gave him hope to keep going. And so I tell you what, Christians need to be that girl with the peach that is always offering hope to someone whenever everybody else may be against them. We need to be the people that brings others in, that we don't shut them out, but we bring them in even if they disagree with you, even if they believe something else than we believe, even if they live different lifestyles than we believe, we need to be welcoming them. The beautiful thing about this is that you already do this. You already eat two or three, three meals a day, right? So all it takes is repurposing some of them and welcoming a new crowd into them, into some of them. They don't need to be fancy. You don't even need a table. You don't even have to have a table. You can go somewhere else and just start eating with people and offering hospitality, welcoming them in. Here's the second thing. If we want to unleash hope in the 21st century, find where God is working and join him. Find where God is working and join him. Uh, let's go back to the prophet Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. This is uh, Isaiah talking about just Israel's Savior to come in the future and God's mercy. And here's what he says. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You know, the people of Israel were so stuck in maybe their past, you know, glorious history of the nation. And then they fell into sin and, and they were going to be taken to Babylon. And, but God says, I'm going to make a new way. So you need to stop looking behind you and start looking ahead. And I tell you what, some of us can get into those same patterns. You know, there are many, many of us that probably wish that culture were different, that things would have turned out a different way, that we wouldn't have to deal with so many things that are uncertain and unknown and maybe threatening to us. But we need to stop looking back and see what God is doing here today. Seeing what God is doing around. Many times, here's the assumption that we make, that if someone isn't a follower of Jesus... God is not at work in their life. Have you ever caught yourself making that assumption? It's like maybe you look at a person who is completely against Christianity and you think, oh, God must not be doing anything in your life. What if we started with the opposite assumption? What if we saw someone completely, you know, against the message and be like, man, God must be doing something in his life because he's really kicking right now against it. God must be really doing something that is, you know, maybe pushing a button Church, we need to open our eyes to what God is doing today, what God is doing in front of you, even with the people that seem unlikely. 
And then we need to get to work bringing hope. How can you partner with God in bringing hope to those people? I remember a few years ago, you know, I was just reminded of how God is always doing something. Um, we had Silver Recovery at this facility. And Silver Recovery is just a program that, you know, gets people together and gets them to go through the different steps. Biblical, you know, try, they try to get it from the Bible and really it's, uh, it's a program that helps people get out of, uh, you know, habits and, and hang-ups and addictions. And uh, as we were doing it, I, just talking to people, I realized that some of them, you know, asked, hey, do we know of any counselors? And, um, you know, it's like you hear once and then you hear again. And I remember like a three or fourth time that someone had mentioned something. I'm like, the only ones that I know are in St. Charles and the old church. And a couple of these people didn't have the resources to, to do it. And so that was that. And a couple of weeks later, I get this phone call from a lady that was a counselor finishing her program and saying, hey, you know, how much would you charge if I could use one of the rooms at the church? You know, I need to do counseling, and I'm finishing, and I'm supervised, so I can't charge right now. I'm not making any money, she said, but I would like to offer counseling in the community around if you can let me use one of the, the, the rooms in the church. I'm like, please come in. We won't charge you anything. You know, you just come and offer your services to the community, and that's it. And so she did. And, and, you know, and, and I think that provided for some of the people. And, of course, I let some of these people that had asked me about it know that she was coming. And I think some of them took advantage of that. And little did I know that later on, this was going to come around and bless our own family. So my wife at the time had been going through celebrate recovery, and she realized I have some past hurts that I need to work out. And, and, and she went, and this, you know, lady was able to help her through some of that. And so... When we are open to the idea that God is always working, and we just open ourselves. I didn't have to do much except say, here's a key to our facility. You know, here's when you can use it. God was already doing it. You don't, sometimes it's just being a small part of it. But God is already at work, and we need to open our eyes and then serve and be open and generous uh, with whatever he's doing. Number three. When, if we want to minister, to, you know, and unleash hope in the 21st century, simply be a witness of Jesus. Just be a witness of Jesus. Acts 1.8, let's go back to Acts chapter 1. Here's the last thing that Jesus tells his disciples in this, in this book. Uh, before going up to heaven. Uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth so their job was to be Jesus witnesses that was it just be a witness now how many of you get anxious just thinking about preaching the gospel you just hear it exactly thank you for those of you who were honest to raise your hand yes it's like you just hear about preaching the gospel and you start thinking man I really don't know what to say or where would I start like, and what if they have questions? What if they have an argument that I haven't heard about and, and I don't know how to reply, how to answer that, right? The reality is that we feel that because we are thinking about preaching the gospel not as a witness, but as a secondhand person, someone who just studied something and now I need to teach you this. And when we look at the gospel like that, it's going to be hard. But Jesus said, all you have to do is be my witnesses. Now, you know, here's the other problem that I see in our culture. The reason why we get extra anxious is because our culture tells us that faith is a private matter. So you are not supposed to share your faith. You can have your faith, right, as long as you don't share it. And Christians, unfortunately, have believed this. We have believed that proselytizing is wrong. 96% of Christians believe Jesus is the best thing that's happened in my life. But half of them, 48%, believe the proselytizing is wrong. The trying to get someone else to share your faith is overstepping our boundaries. I tell you what, this is, there's a glaring inconsistency in the, within the church. We don't believe that we can share our faith. So that's the first problem to address. Let me tell you that proselytizing is okay because everybody does it. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian. Everybody's proselytizing. You're sharing a gospel. Now, what gospel is the question, but you're sharing a gospel. So the, the idea that proselytizing is wrong is actually 
self-defeating because you're proselytizing that others can proselytize. You're telling people you can't tell others about what you believe, but in doing so, you're telling them your belief that it's wrong to tell them. So it's self-defeating. Everyone proselytizes. The question is, what gospel are you preaching? Are you preaching a democratic socialist gospel? Are you preaching an American nationalist gospel? Are you preaching a free market capitalist gospel? Are you preaching an LGBTQ pride gospel? Are you preaching a cold therapy, cold water therapy gospel or a keto diet gospel or a mindfulness gospel? Whatever gospel you're preaching, you're probably preaching a gospel. The question is, is this the gospel of Jesus? Because followers of Jesus are supposed to preach his gospel, not any other gospel. Where, because each, each time you preach something, you are revealing the answer of questions about where your hopes lie, where you think we're going or society is going, what dangers you see ahead. And so the reason why you're adhering to this gospel is because you believe the answer is here, whatever that may be. And if that's not Jesus, then maybe we need to check again what our worldview is. Because the reason why I say that everybody preaches a gospel is because everybody talks about what they love. And so if you love music, you talk about music. If you love sports, you talk about sports. If you love a new TV series, well, you're going to talk about it. The question that we need to ask is, do I talk about Jesus naturally? Like, is he, does he come out in conversations as naturally as the latest TV sitcom or the latest fad and diet or sport, the latest sports news? Like, does Jesus come up in your conversations? And if he doesn't, then maybe you need to spend more time with him. You know, you can go a couple weeks ago, we, we talked about this, about just encountering Jesus on a regular basis. But what does preaching look like, you may ask? What does it look like? Is it preaching on the streets, going to Main Street and, and you know, just yelling at people? Is it passing tracks that look like $100 bills? Is it sharing an Instagram story? Is it an apologetics debate online? Is it just giving a book to a co-worker hoping you don't get fired? Yes, I don't know. Maybe. It's different for every single one of us. But I can tell you this. Unless you do it as a witness, it's not going to work as well as you think. A witness is someone who experiences something important that needs to be shared. So if you witness an accident, you may want to share that so that you find out, people find out who was at fault. If you experience a crime, you want to share that so that what happened, so that someone gets held accountable. If you experience Jesus and you're a witness of Jesus, you know that he can change lives because I hope that he's changing yours. And when you just share that, then people are going to hear it for what it is. You're not a salesperson, okay? Get out of your mind that sharing the gospel is like using sales tactics, you are not responsible for the outcome as well. You know, people will need to make a choice. Am I attracted to this Jesus or am I repulsed by him? That's not your job. You just simply need to share. Evangelism in the early church happened when people just answered the question, why are you so different? Here's why. Here's why I live my life in an unusual way, because of Jesus. So just be a witness of Jesus. And, and here's number four. Be open to the things. Be open to the things. What are the things? Uh, go to John 14, 12. John 14, 12. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and this is the last long, you know, really set of teaching and conversation and prayer that he has with them before being arrested. And he says this, Very truly, tell you, uh, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Now, remember what he was been doing? He'd been preaching the gospel ministering, serving, serving people, eating meals with them, healing them, sometimes even expelling, you know, evil spirits. And he says, they will do the works I've been doing, and they will even do greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And so, greater things than the things that he was doing. What does that mean? I don't exactly know what is greater than what Jesus did, but I know what it isn't. It's not lesser things, okay? And this is something that gets lost. And depending on the movement that you come from, you know, we can land on two different, two different sides. 
And I'll talk about that here in a second. But here's what I want you to know. The same power that was on Jesus is the same power that is on you and me. It's the power of the Holy Spirit, really. And when we realize this, then we need to start to believe that God is still at work in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. And that is hard because it's a little bit unknown and uncertain of exactly how that works. Uh, the, the story is told of there's a church, a movement really called the Vineyard Church Movement. It started in California. And um, the pastor, the founding pastor, came to the Lord by just reading the Gospels and then reading the book of Acts. So he started reading the New Testament and then he came to Jesus. About the time that he was finishing the book of Acts, he, decided, he, he realized, I need to be baptized, and I need to find a body of believers. And so he joins a church, and he gets baptized, of course. And after he gets baptized, and he's joined for, for a little bit, he's doing all the things, coming to worship. And he's like, hey, when, when are we going to start doing the things? And they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, the things, you know, that you see, like, the apostles doing, and the disciples doing. Like, when do we do those things? Like, the healings and all that And they had no concept of that at the church where he was at. And I tell you what, sometimes as Christians, we can be hit like that. Like we we believe that the Bible is true, but sometimes we have a hard time that the God of the Bible is still working in our lives. And, And here's the difficult part, depending on, you know, where you come from, is sometimes for some of us, you know, we are tempted to just keep Christianity very cerebral, and it's just like what I understand, and it's just a bunch of teachings and doctrines. And for some other people, you know, maybe tempted to say, you know, I want to see the happenings and the things, and, you know, I want the emotional experience, and it's almost like it can create a sense of pride, you know, and, and I tell you what, both the opposites are, both extremes are dangerous, but I do believe that Christians need to be open to what God is doing, to the power of God today. We need to not be unbelieving. We need to not seek them for the sake of seeking them. We're seeking Jesus, but we are open to what he is doing. I tell you what, uh, he worked through Peter and Philip and Paul and Silas and some of the disciples in the New Testament. Here are some of the things that I've experienced as well. I know that you know, I, I can't tell you what happens in everybody, but I can tell you what happens in my life. It's happened in my life that I've seen. I've seen God, you know, God heal my mother when she had gallbladder stones. And we didn't have money for the surgery. And you can see, I think my sister still has, you know, the ultrasounds. You can see the ultrasound, you see the stones, and then another ultrasound, and they're gone. Now, did she pass them naturally? Could have been. All I know is that we prayed, and next time we went to the doctor, she was good. You know, I've seen, uh, for, you know, I've, we've prayed, and I know someone from this congregation that had cancer, in prostate cancer, and now they don't. Actually, I know two people like that. I know people in this congregation that had col- uh, colon cancer, and now they don't. Um, now, it doesn't mean that they haven't gone through their the medical procedures, right? And I don't know how it works. All I know is that we prayed for their healing, and, and they are healed. I know people that are here in this room whose other people, family members, pray for them. They pray for them and pray for them and pray for them, and they're sitting here, and I believe because of that. I know of a baby who the doctors recommended mom and dad to abort because they thought he would never be able to walk, and today he's a walking, you know, he's a baby that's walking. I know of marriages that have been saved by the grace of God you know, and, and they are still here today. Yeah, I know that we prayed yesterday. I went to a birthday party, and how awesome it is that at the birthday party, you know, uh, we prayed for, for Larry, you know, to be healed as well. I know that I have a cousin, you know, who is not a believer back in Mexico City who may have liver cancer as well, and I'm praying that God shows up in her life in whatever way. And I don't know what God's going to do. And I don't, he doesn't always say yes. I've also known of, you know, when, times when he says no. And no is an answer. But all I know is that we have to be open. You have to stop being an agnostic Christian. You have to be a Christian that, that believes that God is still working in people's lives today. Lastly, live a beautiful life. Live a beautiful life. 1 Peter 2.12 
says this, live, in su live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Live such good lives. That word good in Greek can also be translated as beautiful. And I, I like that better. Live such beautiful lives that people, even when they, you know, criticize you, they just, all they have to do and say are, are good things. Listen to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He says, whatever your life work is, do it well. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, like Shakespeare wrote poetry, like Beethoven composed music, sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. Living a beautiful life means living just justly in, in, the, in the will of God. Doing whatever he put in front of you to the best of your ability. Living a beautiful life means that you, you just do life his way. And it may be unusual to the world. And it may cost you, by the way. The church history tells us that sometimes living a beautiful life is costly. It, may, it has cost people their lives or their jobs. For us, it may not be that extreme, but it may cost your reputation as a cool, sophisticated person. It may be that some people look at you with less estimation because of, of you know, who you follow. It may be that it may kill some of your career aspirations and ambitions. I don't know. But if you live a beautiful life, you, it's, you reshape your family and it reshapes you and the community. You know, we need to rethink the role of the church in our community. Remember, faith is not for you to be taken to heaven. Faith is meant also so that Jesus can bring heaven to earth through you and I, through the church. Over the years, the church has cared for the sick, the elderly, has built hospitals, orphanages, and schools. And we need to remember and go back to that. Um, at the 20th of the, as the band comes, comes up, at the, 20th, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, a uh, communist Russian government, they wanted to kill the church. But they knew there were too many Christians in Russia still to do it. To just say, it's illegal, you can't meet. So they told them this. They said, you can still meet, but we want you to stop feeding the hungry, stop educating like people, stop housing orphans, stop caring for the sick. The state, the government, will take care of that. You know what happened? 70 years later, the church was completely irrelevant and empty. So what they did is they turned disciples of Jesus, apprentices of Jesus, into church goers. And I'm afraid that we have too many church goers in our culture today. Because being a disciple of Jesus is more than just attending church. It's becoming apprentices of the one who gives life. It's encountering him and then becoming like him and doing the things that he did. When you look at that, that graphic where we stand is in the world, and then you encounter Jesus, you become like Jesus, and then you unleash the hope again. Now, for some of us, it has meant to move to a different country, to leave family behind. For most of you, it may just simply mean to walk across the street and say hi to a neighbor, to make eye contact with the person that's checking you out at the grocery store, to maybe welcome someone to your table, for the very first time. For some of you, it just means that you find what God is doing and you serve there faithfully. That maybe you become a witness of Jesus whenever the opportunities arise. And it may be mean to be open to his moving and his power, even though you don't quite understand how he works. And that you live a beautiful life. And if you can do that, you're going to bring hope. What seems normal to you and I it's brand new to someone else who is without hope right now. Just living good lives, it may seem so normal to us. It's foreign to many people in the world, and they need to see us and hear us. Here's my invitation today. If you are new, and this is something new, um, I want to introduce you to Jesus. He is the one that really can save you. He is the one that has saved me and every single one of us. None of us have the power to do anything in your life that can make a difference, but Jesus can. So invite him into your life.
for those of us who have invited him already, my encouragement is to do it over and over again. Day after day, say yes to him, obey him, live like him, do the things that he did, and you're going to find that your life is going to acquire a new restored beauty, and that's going to shine, and people will ask you why, and then you get to be a witness of him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. I pray that you allow us to be a congregation, Lord, that unleashes your hope into this community. Father, we are humbled by the fact that we get to know you, and we don't claim that we can do anything without you. We simply, Lord, ask that you would move in our lives in ways that this community, uh, Lord, uh, can see your light. Help us uh, be apprentices of yours. And more than just church goers, Lord. And as we do so, Lord, you get the glory and you do what you always do, Lord, which is work in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.